Due to YouTube censorship, there are certain words I cannot say, so you will hear me throughout the video abbreviate them. Certain clips I use for context don't have the best audio, but I fixed them as much as I could. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Lastly, I will speak about Anna's belief system, IBLP, quite frequently. Some of the examples I use is to give you a baseline understanding of the religion. Some follow these teachings by the book, and others adjust them as needed. Also, it goes without saying, any race, gender, religion, or socioeconomic status is capable of anything. Viewer discretion is advised. Anna Duggar, a woman of faith, has chosen to stand by her husband of 13 years, the disgraced Josh Duggar, a mother of seven whose husband was convicted of CP, has made it blatantly clear that despite his infidelity, despite his confession to abusing his sisters and a babysitter, and despite his conviction, she will stand by his side till death do they part. B, the commentator. Girl, what are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about Anna Duggar, the devoted wife of Josh Duggar. Hey, I'm B, and welcome to my channel. If you're new, thanks for watching. If you're returning, thanks for coming back. Before we get started, let me make my intentions clear. It is always my goal to bring truth, information, and awareness to the topics I cover on my channel, no matter who it is. Remember, it's not tea, it's information. I would also like to state that in no way, shape, or form am I expressing that their religion, education, or lack thereof causes one to do the sick things Josh Duggar has done, nor does it excuse it. It goes without saying. Any religious belief, race, gender, socioeconomic status, etc. is capable of anything. It isn't exclusive to the belief system practiced by Anna and her family, but understanding who Anna is has to do with what she has been influenced with, and her belief system is a big part of that. Michael Keller, Anna's father, was born October 29, 1959. Growing up, he was a rebellious child who found himself far from God's preferred way of life. Michael was described as being a man of sin, but at the age of 19, he devoted his life to God and became a Christian after attending a basic youth conference seminar, which is a seminar hosted by founder of the Institute of Basic Life Principles, Bill Gothard. By dedicating and turning his life over to Christ, he was given a new one and completely released from his sinful past. Anna's mother, Suzette, was born April 9, 1955. She was one of six, and it is said that her family was very religious. At the tender age of nine, Suzette devoted her life to God and became a Christian. Every Sunday, she would ride the bus to Sunday school and spent her childhood living a very faithful life. Michael and Suzette would marry July 25, 1980 in Broward County, Florida. He worked as a fabricator while Suzette taught at a Christian school. They decided early on what belief system they would practice and abide by. They chose to raise their family by following the teachings of Bill Gothard. They dedicated their life to the quiverful ideology. This ideology taught the following. The husband has complete authority over his family. The wife is to be his helpmate and help him achieve the goals God has for him. They are to raise obedient children and typically homeschool them as well. There are strict guidelines. Families are encouraged to be financially free, meaning no debt. Typically, the outside world from their perspective is seen as evil and immoral, and they strive to keep their kids from it. Bible study is a must, and families usually join together to study the Bible, memorize scriptures, and follow the commandments. Gothard encouraged his followers to demonstrate what he called character qualities. Some of these included faith, self-control, thriftiness, tolerance, and patience, to name a few. There are a total of 49. In addition, families are prohibited from having any sort of technology in their homes and typically don't communicate with people outside of their circle. In this community, families are encouraged to have as many children as the Lord wants to bless them with. In this system, the older children would take care of the younger ones. They would take care of their hygienic needs, such as bathe them, brush their teeth, comb their hair, the older children fed the younger ones and taught them a skill, usually how to play an instrument. It really means that mom cannot be everywhere at all times, and so my older children help to take care of the younger children. Every Duggar has at least one buddy. If you're too old and need help from a buddy, that means you're ready to take on a younger buddy. A big buddy helps you get dressed, brush your teeth, comb your hair, get your breakfast, do your schoolwork, learn to play violin and piano, and so. They're there to pick you up when you fall and keep track of you when you're out and about. Without the buddy system, this house might cease to a halt. No one is exempt from the buddy brigade. Jim Bob's buddy is Michelle, 
And Michelle reserves the privilege of being each of the children's first buddies. They homeschooled them and acted like their parents. The children usually have quite a busy day as there are several chores they must do around the house, as well as caring for the younger children and going to school. It is said that girls aren't encouraged to pursue careers. They are expected to stay home, help with the family, and any domestic work until they are married, where they would then incorporate those same beliefs. What started out as Gothard desiring Christians to be built up in their faith and trained in how to live the Christian life by applying God's words to the life decisions they make ultimately became a belief system with very strict rules and guidelines, and anyone who disagreed with these restrictions known as the basic life principles were viewed as a sign of spiritual immaturity and rebellion against God. Soon after marriage, the Kellers welcomed their first child, Esther, May 9, 1981. After the birth of their firstborn, Suzette quit working at the Christian school and decided to homeschool her growing family. They would go on and give birth to Rebecca, Daniel, Priscilla, Anna, Susanna, Nathan, and David. In total, they have eight children. The Kellers created an environment where they kept their focus on God's word, God's ways, and God's character. They encouraged all of their children to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior by first realizing and admitting they were sinners that had broken God's holy laws. Then, they needed to realize and understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross, taking the punishment for their sins. And lastly, they needed to repent, turn from their wrong ways, and go towards God's ways with all their heart. Once their children surrendered to God, it is said they all received so much joy and peace in their life and they would go on and help teach Sunday school with their mother in the junior department. The family was very busy, but it was important for Michael and Suzette to spend one-on-one time with their children to see what was on their heart. And it is said that the children had one 15-minute meeting with their parents each week to discuss personal issues or things they wanted to get off their chest. The children had a very strict schedule when it came to domestic work around the house, and they were also required to memorize scriptures. Their parents would compensate them financially if they were able to memorize the Bible. It is said that for Christmas, the children would memorize as many scriptures as they could to make money to buy their own Christmas gifts. Up, that was how we got our amount. We had to learn, memorize. That's where, like, if there's 30 verses in the chapter, then we get $30. So during Christmas time, we had a lot of memorized <laughs> so we could buy a Christmas present, but it was a good challenge. While Suzette stayed home to homeschool their eight children, Michael worked several jobs, and the family lived a very modest life. They weren't wealthy at all. They lived in a small trailer with 10 people and made the best of the situation. In the 90s, he worked as a welder, but after serving jury duty in 1994, Michael developed a passion to help reform juvenile inmates. While serving jury duty, Michael saw a need for Christ in their lives and soon began volunteering at a local juvenile detention center. So, in 1996, he left his full-time job as a welder and dedicated his life to full-time ministry work in prisons. Michael spent months traveling to various churches to work with juveniles and was a steady, humble presence to them. He desired to be someone they looked up to and to this day serves as a mentor and prison chaplain by working at Rock of Ages Prison Ministry Incorporated. Michael is so devoted to this ministry that he also wrote two books specifically for inmates titled Breaking the Bondage of Addictions, and When Tragedy Hits You. Growing up in what some may consider a big family, Anna was very close to her younger sister, Susanna. They were four years apart and described as being thick as thieves. As a child, Anna was lively and loud. She was described as being bossy and would always dictate to her siblings what they should do and how to do it, which is a drastic change from the demure, meek version of what we see today. Initially, Anna didn't have a personal relationship with God like most would think. She recalls going to Sunday school where her teacher would ask the classroom, who prayed the prayer that welcomed Jesus into your heart? Everyone in the class raised their hands except Anna. The teacher then asked, who was baptized? Again, everyone in the classroom would raise their hands except her. At the time, Anna was said to be the only one in her Sunday school class that appeared to not have a personal relationship with him. Though she was sad and felt left out, she also didn't think her relationship with God needed to change or be improved. A few years later, though, that would change. Anna was in a car accident with her older siblings who had flipped their car over into a ditch. Anna and her siblings could have died in that crash, but by the grace of God, they made it out unharmed and alive. And, you know, being raised in a Christian home, I was, you know, prayed the plan of salvation from day one, practically. 
And I remember being in Sunday school and had a great Sunday school teacher that wanted to make sure that all of us knew about Jesus and we're going to spend eternity in heaven. And so she said, how many of you guys had given your heart to Jesus and prayed the prayer? And every hand went up except mine. And I remember all my friends in Sunday school class looking at me and me shocked and be like, oh, you didn't pray the prayer? And all of a sudden I felt like, oh my, I'm not in the club. Like I am left out. And then she said, well, how many of you have been baptized? And again, everybody else except me raised their hand. And so I felt really awkward and left out. And so I remember going home and thinking, well, maybe I can get baptized and I can be like my other friends. And so I was so sad. I started crying and talking to my parents and telling them I wanted to get baptized and saved. And so they shared the plan of salvation. And I appreciated that Jesus died for me. But I didn't want him to have the steering wheel or the control of my life. I wasn't interested in that who I was, and I didn't think I needed help because I was a pretty good person, I thought. And so I prayed the prayer so that I could fit in and be like everyone else in Sunday school. And then as time went by, as years went by, I remember being so frustrated because people talked about their relationship with Jesus and how God speaks to them through his word. I thought, well, if it means... If a Christian is supposed to read the Bible, I'm going to read my Bible every day and I'm not going to miss a day so that I can look like a Christian. And I remember like learning great things but being frustrated. As time went by, I really knew that I had given my life to the Lord. I knew I wasn't saved, but I was afraid of what my friends would say and what would people at church say if they knew that I was just acting like a Christian. And so I was so afraid of what people would think that I remember being under conviction so many times. And I'm not going to do this. And I remember one Wednesday night, our pastor was preaching um, a series of messages on the Holy Spirit and how God's Spirit indwells us and changes our lives. And um, and I, um, that night I was under so much conviction. I said, no, I am not going to do this because I'm afraid of what people will think. And that Saturday, my sister and I and my brother were running an errand and my sister fell asleep driving and flipped her car in the ditch. And the first thing I remember after everything was silent was like, I could have died. I could have yeah. gone to hell. Yeah. The next day at church, all of our friends were like, hey, you know, so glad you guys were okay. We heard about the car accident. And so I was there and I was like, yes, I was so glad praising the Lord for his mercy. And I was like, you know, if we had died, I know where I'd be. And in my heart, I was like, yeah, I know where I'd be. I'd be in hell right now if I died. That's really scary. And so I remember being miserable for a few days. Um, and so then after about three days, I remember I was milking our goats. We had goats at the time. And so I was milking our goats. I thought I should quote Matthew 25 because it's something I've memorized. And it talked about, it has three parables about comparing Christians with the unsaved virgins. And five were wise, five were foolish. And the five wise virgins had God's spirit indwelling them. And the, the five foolish were empty. They were both virgins, they were both good girls, but yet in five of them, Christ lived in their lives and flowed and his light shined through them naturally. And the other ones looked right, but they didn't have power. They didn't have God's spirit flowing through them. And I was so convicted because I was like, I was trying to be a good person and have good character and do what was right, but I didn't have God's power flowing through me. It was all my own efforts and I was so empty and so I remember going and telling my mom I need to talk with her and telling her that God convicted me and showed me that I wasn't saved and kneeling down in my parents' bedroom and committing my life to the Lord. And I have had no regrets. And like, it's so scary to look back and think I was so afraid of what people would think that I was willing to risk my eternity. She would then pursue a faithful life with God, being at the forefront of everything she did. On December 25, 2001, Christmas Day, 13-year-old Anna came across an article featuring the Duggars. At the time, Jim Bob was serving as state representative in Arkansas and in the process of running for U.S. Senate. It caught her attention as the article depicted a family similar to hers with similar values and morals. She noticed the attire they wore, and at the time, they had 13 children. Anna was very fascinated with them and thought how nice it would be if one day she could meet them. Realistically, it would prove to be quite difficult as the Duggars lived in Arkansas and Anna's family in Florida. As Anna fantasized about the Duggars and hoped one day to meet them, little did she know their eldest child, Josh, who would become her future husband, would M two of his sisters shortly after this article came out. 
With her father working in the prison ministries, Anna would frequently go with him on these ministries and mentor young women who were incarcerated. She would go with her sisters and mother weekly to encourage troubled women who wanted to turn their lives around. They would print out scriptures and excerpts from the Bible to help bring the prisoners back to God. Like her father, Anna wanted to help those that had strayed away from God to help bring them back and rebuild their life. About growing up with uh, mom and dad working in prison most of the time. Wow, that's a good question. For um, prison, they did ministry work in the prison ministry, and it was such a blessing for my parents to be able to come back and share with us what God did in the lives of the men and women that they were working with. And it gave us a desire to be able to one day work in um, the ministry as the prison ministry, just volunteering on like once a month or sometimes once a week and just be able to go in and see God change lives. That was such a blessing. Mm -hmm. And it was exciting to see how God provided um, finances mm -hmm. and met specific needs. And um, there's not a lot of books and material, uh, Bible study material for the inmates. And so um, just seeing God provide a printer for my dad to be able to print tracks mm -hmm. and also to provide books and the finances for um, you know, our family to live. And so it was neat to see how God loves us and is interested in meeting even the little specific needs. In 2004, at the age of 16, Anna would graduate from her homeschooling course through ATI. Upon completion of high school, Anna would then begin teaching Sunday school. Like her parents, she had devoted her life to Christ and was an exemplary woman of virtue. It was also this year where she would watch a Discovery Health Channel special of the Duggars called 14 Kids and Pregnant Again. In this special, the Duggars were showcased as if they were some spectacle. Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar showed off their unusually large family, their buddy system, and unwavering faith. As Anna and her family watched this program after receiving a copy of it from a friend, she was in awe because she felt she could relate to the Duggars and their upbringing. But that wouldn't be the only thing that caught Anna's eyes. The eldest son, Josh Wood. Anna would watch then 16-year-old Joshua, quote, pour his heart out to Christ as he shared the importance of guarding his heart and waiting for someone who would really love him and wasn't going to get carried away with their emotions, end quote. Take a look. I think I don't look at it as much as dating as I do looking for a lifelong partner. And I think that you can give your heart away to so many. And I think that if you're going to give your heart away, you need to be giving it to someone who's going to love you and care about you and not someone who's going to simply get carried away with their emotions. Anna was so excited to come across a family who shared the same moral compass and was being trained the way her and her siblings were. What Anna wouldn't know was that Josh had recently returned home and reunited with his family after he was sent away for emming four of his younger sisters, a babysitter, and having a porn addiction. Anna would also come to know the Holtz in this documentary, who would testify against Josh in the CP case years later. In 2006, 18-year-old Anna would attend the ATI Home Educators Conference, where she would finally meet the Duggars in person. Josh was at this conference in Texas, I believe, with his family, working in the AV department. The conference is attended by thousands of people, hundreds of families, typically with the same belief system who follow Bill Gothard's teachings and principles. Josh was busy working at this conference, but that wouldn't stop Anna along with her family from introducing themselves. At some point during Josh's lunch break, the Kellers would approach him and strike up a conversation. This moment must have been a great one for Anna, almost like a dream come true. She first came across the Duggars when she was 13 in a news article and always had the hope that one day she could meet them. Fast forward a few years later, she would watch their documentary special where she would notice Josh and was impressed by his devotion to Christ and the way in which he was guarding his heart for the right one. Now, two years after that special, she was finally coming face to face with this family she had idolized. During their conversation, Josh would talk about his father, Jim Bob's political campaign, and shared that his family was getting to move into the big house that they now reside in. He would even invite Anna and her family to come visit them, and Anna was pleasantly surprised at how nice she thought Josh was. Unbeknownst to her, Josh had way more vivid thoughts than Anna did. He is quoted saying that for him, it was love at first sight. But the group wouldn't talk for too long as Josh had to get back to work in the AV department. But this conversation definitely left a lasting impression, but more for Josh than it did Anna. Josh felt that God spoke to his heart that Anna was the one. 
and with that information, he took it back to his father, Jim Bob, to share. When Josh told his father what God had disclosed to him about Anna, Jim Bob encouraged Josh to prepare himself to court Anna and possibly marry her. Josh went to bed thinking about what God had placed in his heart and said he couldn't get her out of his thoughts. He dreamt about her all night long until he eventually fell asleep. At some point, Jim Bob reached out to Anna's parents and invited them to Arkansas for fellowship. So, a few months later, to Anna's surprise, her parents informed her they would be taking a trip to visit the Duggars. Anna was thrilled but kept her feelings and excitement to herself. It should be noted that when courting in this community, the potential couple seeks accountability through their parents. Parents are really the driving force behind courtships and serve as the God-given authorities. Oftentimes, the couple relies heavily on the acceptance, guidance, and direction of the parents. When the Kellers arrived at the Duggars' home, they proceeded to have Bible time, where Josh would share his testimony. This night is allegedly the night where Anna supposedly was made aware of the things Josh had done a few years prior. Remember, he emmed four of his sisters, a babysitter, and had a porn addiction and was sent away as punishment for his sins. After Josh shared his testimony, Anna would say, quote, I was encouraged to see that there really was a young man out there who was accountable to his parents and was striving to keep his heart pure, end quote. Now, I don't know the extent of Josh's details when he made this testimony. I wouldn't imagine that he would tell a group of people during Bible study all that he did. So I believe it may have been a general testimony, but I don't know. Anna would then go to her parents and inform them that she had feelings for Josh, in which they encouraged her to keep those feelings to herself and pray about it. She wasn't even allowed to tell her siblings. Months ago, even before we knew anything, she just felt like he was the one. But I said, well, don't say anything. Let's just pray about it and wait. We didn't drop any hints to the Duggar family at all. We just prayed and were quiet. And God did a work in Josh's heart. As the Kellers stayed in the Duggars' home during their visit, Anna would observe Josh and saw a lot of qualities in him that she desired in a spouse. When the Kellers' visit was up, Josh ran to his dad and reaffirmed his theory that God chose Anna for him as his wife and that she was most definitely the one for him. Jim Bob agreed that Anna was the one for Josh and encouraged Josh to pray about it and prepare himself financially and spiritually to welcome a wife. Now, in my opinion, I do believe Jim Bob and Michael Keller were in frequent communication regarding the connection between their children, Josh and Anna. I believe the Duggars looked at Anna as the perfect option for their son because her family was utterly devoted to helping prisoners or people with records restore and redeem their lives. Josh did some things that if his father hadn't protected him from, would have received punishment for. I believe Jim Bob knew that Josh could have ended up like the people the Kellers mentored, and because he knew they had a soft spot and a heart to see past whatever crimes they committed, they would welcome and accept Josh. A year later, both families would attend the annual ATI Home Educators Conference in Texas in 2007. They spent a lot of time together and continued getting to know each other. Even though Anna and Josh had both expressed an interest for one another to their parents, they hadn't expressed those feelings to each other. Anna's father would question her about her feelings for Josh. Anna would tell her father that she had feelings for Josh and thought he was the one for her. And her father would agree and confirm that he thought Josh was the one for her as well. A week later, Anna had a special visitor. Josh was in town for work and needed a place to stay. The Kellers offered their residence as a place for Josh to sleep that night, which he did. In the morning, Anna overheard a conversation with Josh and her mother, Suzette. Josh would tell Suzette that he was starting his own business and looking for a house to prepare himself for marriage and a family. Anna's heart jumped when she heard Josh express his future plans. When Josh returned home to Arkansas, he put those plans into action and was working diligently to create a stable life for his future wife. At the end of that year, Anna's brother asked Josh if he would like to help him with the seminar in a Florida state prison for anger resolution. Josh would say yes, and the following month found himself making the 1,000-mile trip to North Florida. The two would spend a week teaching the seminars at a maximum state security prison and then return to the Keller's home to rest. Josh at this time felt now was the time to let Anna's father know he was ready to court his daughter. Josh gathered the strength and after dinner when everyone was fast asleep, he pulled Michael to the side and asked if he could have permission to date Anna. Michael wasn't surprised as he, his wife, and the Duggars had been praying for this courtship for over a year, but he would tell Josh that he needed a month to pray about it. 
The next day, Michael would agree to let Josh court his daughter, Anna. The two were so elated that their parents gave their blessings and allowed them to be in an official courtship. During this process, both families began praying incessantly that the Lord would guide this courtship and bless them. Anna says this time in her life was very precious because it allowed for her and her mother to grow even closer. They would often discuss the role of a wife and mother and what it meant to be a keeper of the home. From a little girl, Anna was raised with the expectation to one day marry. Her goals weren't to have a successful career. Her goals were to be a wife, a mother, and a homemaker. In their community, girls are raised with those expectations. Now, with Anna finally officially courting Josh, she was closer to her dreams than she even realized. A few months later, Josh would surprise her with a vacation to Florida right before her 20th birthday. In anticipation for his arrival, Joshua planned a surprise proposal to Anna while she was out to eat with her parents. Josh was in constant contact with her father, and the two arranged this proposal that we saw broadcasted for the world to see. Take a look. That's when I walk around the corner. She had no idea whatsoever. She was totally surprised, absolutely floored. Uh, God did a miracle. Usually, usually she's not so speechless. <laughs> when I looked up, I was just like, whoa. It's like, it, popped in her head. It didn't, it took a few seconds to realize it really was Joshua. <laughs> My parents went to go look around at the restaurant. You, you stay here. You, two, you talk. Talk. Yeah, you'll be okay. We'll be, we'll be right back. And then Joshua um, got up. So. Wow. That countdown was off. Oh. Yeah, so I have another question for you. Yeah? <laughs> Come here. <laughs> oh. You gotta take that one off. Yeah. Anna, will you marry me? Yes. <laughs> oh. The newly engaged couple would drive from Florida to Arkansas to go see the house they would be moving to once they were officially married. Anna would be relocating to Arkansas with Josh and his family and be completely immersed in the quiverful way of life. Josh looked like he had everything in order. The home they would be moving to was a house his family rented out in the past. Josh had his own business running the car dealership lot, and Anna looked more than thrilled to insert herself into his world. Throughout Josh's upbringing, he was encouraged by his father, Jim Bob, to find a woman like his mother, Michelle Duggar. Upon meeting Anna and falling in love with her at first sight, Josh was drawn to her because she reminded him of his mother. Josh constantly reminded Anna of that, and I'm sure she felt the pressure to live up to it. Those were big shoes to fill. With Anna preparing to become a wife, her mother, Suzette, as well as her soon-to-be mother-in-law, Michelle, instilled these things in Anna and what would be expected of her. The IBLP teaches that as a wife, you are uniquely qualified to fully meet your husband's needs and cause him to rejoice in the wife of his youth. This belief system teaches the seven basic needs of a husband to wives so they may take these steps to meet these needs. Number one, a man needs a wife who is loyal and supportive. Helping her husband fulfill these goals and dreams is a wife's main responsibility. As a wife, it is Anna's job to support Josh's vision as he establishes the goals and priorities for their family. They are advised that a foolish wife will crush her husband's spirit by resisting his decisions, and God will hold her accountable for disobeying her husband. Anna was taught to encourage her husband, believe in him no matter what, never take over, seek her husband's advice first, and to be there for him physically whenever he desires. Number two. A man needs a wife who will honor his leadership. Anna was taught to honor Josh's God-given authority, express appreciation and admiration for his godliness, submit to him, and don't undermine his leadership. Number three, a man needs a wife who develops inward and outward beauty. 
Anna was taught that a meek spirit and quiet spirit are the keys to genuine attractiveness, that the wife sets the mood in the home. She was taught that it is essential for a wife to promote an atmosphere of peace in the home. A wife can achieve this by keeping a home free of clutter and by training the children to be orderly. Anna was taught that it is also important for a wife to keep up with her outward beauty and be attractive to her husband. A wife should dress to please her husband. She should always be well-groomed. A wife should also practice self-control, especially in the area of diet. The IBLP teaches that God is concerned about the bondage of overeating and gluttony, and many wives struggle with this issue of self-control, especially after giving birth. A wife is to let God know she cares about her weight and that her efforts to stay healthy and physically fit will bless her husband. So, i tell you what, I can't believe that you've had 18 children. It's like you haven't had any. Can I have another one? <laughs> Number four, a man needs a wife who will make appeals, not demands. Number five, a man needs a wife who will understand his need for time alone with God. Number six, a man needs a grateful wife. And number seven, a man needs a wife who will be praised by others. These are the seven basic needs by the IBLP. These needs were drilled into Anna in preparation for her marriage. It was also advised that if Anna disobeyed these orders, she would be rebellious against God and an ungodly wife. After six months of courtship, Anna and Josh would marry September 26, 2008. Upon their marriage, the two would soon establish their roles in the relationship, with Josh being the provider and Anna a stay-at-home wife. Josh ran a pre-owned car dealership, while Anna served as his helpmate and devoted wife. The couple immediately began expanding their family like the quiverful ideology says they should, and welcomed their firstborn, Mackenzie, a baby girl born October 2009. Two years later, they welcomed their second child, Michael, a boy, in June 2011. The small family lived close to the Duggars in the main house and were frequent cast members of the Duggars TLC show 19 Kids and Counting. Early into their marriage, Josh began expressing his desire to follow in the footsteps of his father, Jim Bob, and delve into the land of politics. Five years later, with three children, Josh and Anna would relocate to Washington, D.C., where Josh would pursue his dream career in politics. He landed a job as the executive director for the Family Research Council Action, which was a conservative Christian organization. Anna expressed during this time that this move would be hard for her because she was accustomed to their way of life in Arkansas. She was accustomed to the pace. She had the support of Josh's large family, and in moving to Washington, they would be small fish in a big pond. But being the supportive wife she was, Anna supported Josh's dream, and the family would relocate in 2013. In Washington, D.C., Josh represented the new face of the Research Council while Anna was going through such a culture shock. Her husband landed his dream job while she stayed home, kept the house, as well as care for their children. Little did Anna know, Josh's dream job wasn't the only thing keeping him busy. I would like to point out that growing up, Anna was baby number four. And in a YouTube video, she described herself as being last on the totem pole. Josh was the oldest and was favorited in his family. He was used to the attention, admiration, and being in the spotlight, yet Anna was used to being in the shadows. This period in their relationship is a good example of those dynamics, and the life Anna once knew would soon be crushed. The evil that their belief system says they should stay away from would actually be in her home. Stay tuned for part two.